Denver is one win away from their first title ever, and there's nothing the casuals can do about it. Run It Back starts now. Run it up, the run it back. Yeah. Run it up, the run it back. Run it back. Run it up. Good Monday morning. We are back, but we are not back because we're all in very different places. Uh, introducing everyone, Stadium Insider Sham Sharania, Chandler P coming to us from Orlando. I can tell he's thrilled. And Eddie Gonzalez there on the end from his home. That is that is nice to see. Do you are you having a good time, Chandler? I did. I did. It's my brother's birthday today. Happy oh. birthday, today. So It's my godson's birthday. He got baptized. Had a lot a, a jam packed weekend, but it was a lot of fun. Ooh, that's a family weekend if there ever was one. Love that for yeah. you. Uh, guys, we have a game tonight. It's, it was weird to have an entire weekend during the finals and not have a game, but it's back tonight. And Denver's just one win away from their first ever giant parade. Eight and a half point favorites back at home in Denver. Um, look, the odds are what they are, Chandler. But as we've been saying all season long, or at least during the playoffs, don't count out Miami. Don't count out Miami. At some point, that's going to run out of juice. Should we count out Miami? Yeah, I think it's over. I, I will say that, that, that that's that's a lot of points, though. If I was a betting man, I would definitely take the Heat plus eight and a half tonight. That's just that's a lot of points, and the Heat are not a team that are just going to lay down. We've seen it all playoffs long. This is a team that's resilient. This is a team that battles. This is a team that is tough. They're not going to give up. I just think they've kind of, they finally have met their match. Denver is too good. Denver has really made adjustments, especially on the pick and roll. Where Matt Barnes said it last week. A lot of guys just switch too easily off pick and rolls and off actions. The Nuggets made that a point to not do that, to not even allow them to get a mismatch last game. And so I think with their defensive adjustments, the effort they're given there, the, the production that they're getting from Aaron Gordon and Bruce Brown and, and guys like that, it's just too much. And, and then we look at the Nuggets all season long. They, they've been the best team, and, and now they've been the healthiest team throughout the playoffs, and, and it just seems like it's their year. And I fully believe that they get it done tonight and they get their first ever championship. Yeah, I, I'm counting them out. I'm sorry. Like, the, the Jimmy stuff yeah. was fun while it lasted, and his, his scoring has went down in each series since the opening round. Mm -hmm. It's actually kind of funny. If you think back, the Bucks allowing him to score 35 points a game is a little absurd when you look at everything that's happened since then. But, yeah, I, I'm counting them out. You can't drop both games at home. You tried all your – you tried the Kevin Love thing. You've you've tried the zone. You've got out of the zone because the zone stopped working. You've you, you've almost run out of answers. I respect Eric Spolstra. I think he's the best coach in the league. But there's only so many things he can do with what he has. Uh, doesn't seem like Tyler Hero is going to ever play in this series, which is mm -hmm. unfortunate. So I, there's no ace left in the hole for them. Can they maybe steal this game and maybe push the series and and on and on? Sure. But the Nuggets have clearly established themselves as the better team the deeper team, they're getting more contributions from their bench and from their other guys, like Chandler just said. When you have Christian Perron playing as great as he's playing, uh, Bruce Brown obviously had an incredible game uh, in game four. You, you can't match that. When, when Bruce Brown is out playing Jimmy Butler, the series is over, I'm sorry. And uh, it's unfortunate because I wanted a better, more competitive series. And I know this is like the true Hooper uh, series for the real Hoop fans and all that stuff. But there was very little tension in this series, and, and that's unfortunate because we had a great season, as that one Twitter thread has shown us, and had a great playoff <laughs> run. But this is the Denver Nuggets year, and I think tonight they get it done. Yeah, I'm not going to say I'm picking the Heat to win this series, but I'm not going to count them out of tonight. Uh, I was at Game 4 and post game. A lot of the people around the Heat were saying just how banged up Jimmy Butler is, how banged up Gabe Vincent is. So I'm not saying that's an excuse for Miami. They've been through a lot, probably a lot more than – uh, you know, Denver had nine days off between the conference finals and the NBA finals. The Heat were on a flight to Denver right after game seven from Boston. That's a long flight. So there's been no rest from Miami. And I think this Jimmy Butler series, he has not had a signature game. Uh, I think in every other round in the Eastern playoffs, he had a signature moment, a big 40, 50 point game, or just a game where even in the Knicks series, he plays through an ankle sprain, really gives that, that Heat team life. They, they take home court advantage. We haven't seen that signature game. I guess in game two, 21 points, nine assists. He, he was great, I think, getting his teammates involved in that game. But he's not even among the top four leading scorers in the fourth quarter in this series. And I think that's not the Jimmy Butler that we've seen so far in, the, in these playoffs. So I'm going to go off on a limb, I guess, and say that I think Jimmy Butler has a signature moment uh, tonight. And, and I do think that Miami, hopefully, uh, for all of us, will be competitive. 
I like that you're doing. It's almost like you're uh, you're wishing it into an existence so we can get a better series. Uh, Aaron Gordon, by the way, who to thunk it? The kid from Orlando that we saw years ago is now a huge part of this Nugget squad. He had 27 points the other night. Kind of fun to watch from a flashy dunker to a very, very important part of the team. Chandler, I mean, what can you say about Aaron Gordon that hasn't been said so far? Just the development of his entire game, right? You look at his entire playoff here. He went from guarding Anthony Edwards and Carl Anthony Towns to Kevin Durant to LeBron James and now Jimmy Butler. So when you look at this team, the Denver Nuggets, they aren't a defensive team, right? They have an unbelievable scoring passing big in Jokic and they have an unbelievable scoring playmaking guard in Jamal Murray. And then you throw in just this real treat for those two guys that can kind of take on that load and take on that responsibility every single night to go and guard the best player and he's physical and he's worked on his game he's worked on his handle you see him in the post just kind of exposing mismatches down low when he gets a guy too small on him he can get the defensive rebound he pushes and starts to break so not only has he, he he has gotten a lot better and he has improved his game majorly but he's a perfect fit for this team. He's a perfect fit for Jokic. He's a perfect fit for Jamal Murray. And he's a huge reason why they are winning this series and they're gonna inevitably be NBA champions is because Aaron Gordon and how much better he's gotten. And, and it's still, a lot of guys in the NBA, they're big, they're strong. When you watch him play, he seems like a man playing with boys. He's just got, he has more physicality. And we're talking about this mighty, disciplined, tough Miami Heat team. And Aaron Gordon's taking it to him every which way. He's on the floor. He's busy. He's battling the post. He is doing everything possible just to kind of beating them at their own game. So uh, you, when you think of him, you're right. You think of that dunk contest with Zach Levine. You think of high flyer. But no, he, he was on the verge of being an all-star this year. Looking now, he probably should have been in it to some of those other guys. <laughs> and, and, and he's become a real NBA player and a huge piece to this team. It's, it's funny how winning can change the perception of a player, like, to a T. I I mean, a few years ago, Devin Booker was a bad team, good stats guy. And, and same thing with Aaron Gordon. When he was, he was drafted fourth overall, he was meant to be a cornerstone for the Orlando Magic. He was very ball dominant, and it, it just didn't seem like he was qualified for that role. You look where he's at now. He finds the perfect situation. He finds the, he's, the, he's the perfect complement to Nikola Jokic because of what Chandler said, the way he defends all these guys, the way he can play – with more physicality. It's not that Jokic doesn't, but he's so nimble and he will play outside of the paint so often. You need that physical force in the inside the paint. And you watch those highlights they show. He's just thriving in that role. He's not having to dribble. He's catching, he's dunking, he's catching and shooting threes. It, it's perfect for him. Like, situations matter so much in the league. And so it's, it's ball dominant as you think of him as a, in Orlando Magic. This is his second highest scoring season of his career. You know, he's, he's thriving in this role. And it's just a huge reason why they're as dominant as they have been so far. And, and, and it's great. I mean, he's still a young guy. He still can, can have great years like this. That's the scariest part about this, this Denver Nuggets team. They have so many guys under 30, and their entire core is essentially under 30, that w who knows how long a stretch they can run off of. The league is going to have to adjust to what they're doing. And it's just one of those teams where they, they swing the pendulum for the rest of the league. And they're that great. They, they should. I think everyone looks right now at the end result, right? But this has been years and years coming. And yeah, Aaron Gordon is the missing piece for the, for the Denver Nuggets. And this really started in 2021. You have to give a lot of credit. Denver's old president, Tim Connolly, he goes out and makes the trade for Aaron Gordon during that 2021 trade deadline. And this is a guy who he had interest from, from the Houston Rockets. He was entering. Uh, he's gonna, he was going to go into the last year of his deal. He, the Rockets were one of the teams, I'm told, that were willing to give him a, an extension of up to $80 million dollars. And so the, the Nuggets had to grapple with the fact that they were going to have to, if they were going to trade for him, they would have to pay him an excessive amount of money as well. And they, but they really viewed him as that guy that can be the missing piece with Jamal Murray, uh, Nikola Jokic, and, and the group that they had there. Then Jamal Murray, unfortunately, turns ACL. But I keep coming back to that team in 2021 was really prime to make it to the finals. Now, would they have won? I'm not so sure. But now they get a couple of years. Jamal Murray's back to himself. And I think you can look back at that trade when and Calvin Booth, who's now running the Nuggets, uh, you know, as of right now, he was going back and forth with Aaron Gordon's agent, you know, really trying to ask him, do you really think he's our missing piece? And Calvin Andrews, Aaron Gordon's agent, kept saying, yes, he will be. And they got him. They made the trade. Then they pay him $92 million. 
and now you see Aaron Gordon. To me, he's kind of like what Wiggins was last year for the Warriors, where he, I don't know if he's gonna win finals MVP, but you can't say that the Warriors last year would have won without Wiggins, and you can't say the Nuggets win this year without Aaron Gordon. I love a good Cinderella story. There's so many of these stories in this playoff, especially in Denver. Bruce Brown is another one, by the way. Had a hell of a fourth quarter. Um, he has the option this to opt out if he wants to. Has he played himself into a highly coveted player position, Chandler? Like, if you're another team, are you going after him? 1,000%. And I'm definitely opting out with the hopes to return to this team because, again, I think he has gotten a lot better, right? I think he's worked in his game. His jump shot is completely different than it was when he was coming out of Miami. So as much as he's gotten better, you can credit that to him, you can credit that to the Nuggets. He's also a, a product of this system, and he is very good, as is Aaron Gordon, with those two guys, and I think those guys make it easier. But on the flip side, so does he, and every team across the league can use someone like Bruce Brown, who pretty much is a point guard that can play all the way through four or five. He can switch pick and rolls. He defends. He's now creating his own shot and he's shooting the three pointer at a, at a high percentage. So he's turned himself into this all around player and he's undersized, but it doesn't matter because he battles. He, he, I remember Brooklyn, remember he was playing this, he was playing center at some point. It was ridiculous uh, as a point guard. So I think he's definitely deserved himself a, a bag this summer. And just because he's valuable, every team needs these role players like the P.J. Tucker, like the Patrick Beverly's, the Alex Caruso's. Bruce Brown was that, and now he's even more. Now he's a starting player in the NBA, and he showed that during this playoffs, and he he took over that game in the fourth quarter last game. So he, he's definitely, if I'm his agent, he's already opted out. Yeah, I mean, he, I, I was shocked he got the deal he got this summer. I was shocked the Nets let him go after what he showed for them hmm. in the two years there that I saw him. He was great in the Celtics series, and, and yes, he was the, the recipient of a lot of softer coverages against the, the way they were attacking Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving, but he thrived in it. He took advantage of it. He had, huge, he had a couple huge games, and he was great throughout the season. Like Chandler mentioned, he was playing like a pick-and-slip center, but he has a lot of – he has great touch on his floater and the rim, and, and he's, he's powerful at the rim. He's, he's a pretty big dunker, and he was starting to knock down threes. Uh, he could handle the ball a little bit. I remember me and Kevin were coming back from games just kind of like in, wild impressed with what he was doing. So the the idea that, that people were running off that Kevin asked for him to be pushed out or whatever off of a comment where he denied that just blew my mind because we were very impressed with him in Brooklyn. I'm not shocked at all he's thriving in Denver. It's a perfect situation for him, and he's taking advantage. And he's been a gamer. Like, a lot of people laughed at the attempted game-winning shot he took against the Bucks. But I remember thinking, like, yo, it was, that was ballsy to do that. Like, they have Kyrie and KD on the court. The play was for Kyrie. He saw open lane. He tried to go get a layup. He missed it, unfortunately. But it was bold of him to try it. Um, I'm not shocked he's thriving. He has a, he has a lot of great tools. He's 6'4", but he has crazy long arms. He plays very physical. He defends. Uh, I think he's going to get a bag. I think it would be smart for him to stay in Denver. But if he goes and gets the money, I can't blame him. I think he deserves it. How much of that matters if – if or when Denver wins, is it easier to leave? I mean, how does how does the thinking go as a player on that? Or is it more that you want to stay and get another one? Well, I think it works both ways, right? I think someone like that maybe thinks the grass is a little bit greener individually and selfishly that he can go and expand his role. He can be a starter somewhere else. He can go and try and average 16 to 20 points somewhere else. But, uh, you know, hopefully he's got good you know, support system around him that understands him and his game and his needs and what he needs to succeed. And it's this roster that he's currently on and it's the system and it's Coach Malone. And people always say, we never seen anyone like Jokic, right? When you ask these other players, these older players, who, who would they want to play with of anybody in the league? It's Jokic. And so when you look at a guy like Bruce Brown, you look at a guy like Aaron Gordon, it, it's it's showing that how these guys, Jokic, Murray, they're changing these guys' careers. So I hope he comes back because he's valuable and this team could use him and this team obviously needs him. But like Eddie said, if if, if he's going to get a huge payday somewhere else, you can't knock the kid for going to get, get a, getting a bigger deal somewhere else. Never. I would yeah, never right. knock that. Okay, look, we, we probably – oh, go ahead. Sorry, Eddie. What does it say? He made $6.5 million this year. His option's a little bit higher than that. But if you can push the $10, 12 $14 million, oh, yeah. yeah, you got to leave at that point. 
I mean, you can live on six and a half, but yeah, it certainly would be nicer to um, to double that up. Look, we got we have to focus a little bit on Miami, and and maybe it's just simply they ran out of juice, but their inability to do anything at home did that shock you at all, Chandler? That it just seemed like they were anemic at best. Yeah, I am surprised just because how electric that place could be, how there hasn't been a finals game there in so long. Um, but this comes down to their role players. You look across the board, Bam's been pretty good. Jimmy has been solid, but he hasn't had that one big game that Sean has been talking about. But Max Struess has been abysmal. And this is a guy who's been knocking down shots for them and who's been efficient from the field. Duncan Robinson had his highs and lows, but he presents such a defensive challenge where literally they have to go to zone every time he's on the court, which enables their entire system and, and what they're trying to do. Uh, Caleb Martin, I think he had such a good Eastern Conference Finals, and you could never take that from him. But I think people put these unrealistic expectations on this guy, like he was that top three player on the championship team, uh, and that wasn't really fair. So yeah, I think it, I think it is a little shocking because teams usually come out, especially in the playoffs, juiced, ready. The crowd is rocking. They they protect home court. And we've seen they've gone they've gone two and zero. I think when they were on the elimination games on the road. So this team has been very confusing. But the, again, this is not a team that is just going to lay down. They've had more success, honestly, on the road this year. So it's not that tough for them to go to Denver again. But I am very very surprised. But it, it's just been down to their role players. That their role players haven't knocked the shots down. They haven't played as good as they had it in, in the Eastern Conference Finals that they are now. Can they bounce back? I mean, you mentioned. Caleb, Gabe Vincent, Struess, can they bounce back? I mean, I I know this is the whole mantra, right? Don't count them out, don't count them out. But if you're Coach Bolster, are you looking around that locker room going, all right, I got the most, I got everything I could get out of these guys? Or is there a little I'll say, I'll say this. They know they're one game away from now the series switching again, just like in the last, right. in the po- previous series. So you, you take this one play at a time. It sounds cliche. You take this one quarter, one play, every possession matters. As soon as you win this game tonight and it goes back to Miami, now all of a sudden Denver feels it and they understand that they let one go and they could have closed it out. And Malone said it a lot of times when teams get up this high, they kind of come up for air. And so it's interesting. We'll see tonight. I think Miami does come out to a hot start tonight. I think they jump out early. I think they're super aggressive. They're going to be the first to throw the first blow. Uh, and, and I think it's. I think that's what they need to do. But yeah, you win this game, then it gets really interesting. Oh, Eddie, you got anything? I, I mean, I think the series is. I think the series is over. I mean, I, I understand what Chandler's saying about putting pressure back on the Nuggets, but. Yeah, two of these last three games at home. This, this is not the three-one comeback. I don't. I don't see 2016 again. And if you look at the games, they've been gotten progressively wider. Two double-digit losses at home. That that has to be demoralizing. I mean, there's there's no way around it. And and like I mentioned earlier, I think they're running out of strategic, you know, counters. They're running out of things to do. I like putting Kevin Love out there and saying, yo, he can guard Aaron Gordon. He doesn't. He, he doesn't dribble. We don't think he can shoot. And then Aaron Gordon goes out and has a three-point game. So it's it, we're running out of stuff we can try. Uh, I, I don't see it. I mean, I think I always like to say, like, I like to see how teams compete when the when the champagne and the trophy are in the building. The trophy's in the building. The NBA just posted a picture, put it in the middle of the court. Mm-hmm. Trophy's in the building. I'm expecting Denver to, you know, act like they know it's out there and get this over with at home, celebrate in front of their home fans. So funny. that It's in the building. Shams, you recently sat down with Caleb Barton. <laughs> We're going to run that interview right now. I'll talk to you about it afterwards. Here it is. I think Eric calls. Hey, he's already in Miami. He's already got the booster shot. He can be ready by tomorrow morning. I don't have, I'm not in Miami. I don't have a booster shot. So I got to drive all the way to Charlotte, get the, the booster shot, drive all the way back to Raleigh, fly out that night, be ready for the uh, scrimmage in the morning. And so I do all that, and they think I'm down the street, you know, in Miami. So then we come, we work out in the morning. I kill the run. And uh, like about an hour after we got down or whatever, I was on the scooter, literally right down on the street down there. I was on the scooter um, riding back to my hotel. And that's when uh, Eric called me about them offering a two-way. Obviously I was grateful and appreciative for the two-way just to get my foot in the door. But, you know, I was just playing for a locker. You know what I mean? I was playing for respect. I was playing, you know what I mean? Playing, just trying to earn my stripes and stuff like that. And just show people like I belong in the association. Uh, I just I love everything about that, Shams. What was your biggest takeaway? 
I mean, the moment he said it, I'm like, what an amazing white lie to tell the team that you're trying out for, that you're in a, you're in their city, that you have the booster shot at the time you need to get, you know, the, the proper vaccination. So he lied about both of them, uh, got it done uh, at the end of the day, went and worked out, killed the workout, got it two way. Then he got a three year, 20 plus million dollar deal. And now next year, you assume he's going to opt out and sign an even bigger contract. So. Uh, shout out Caleb Martin for that. I don't know, Chandler, have you seen a player just lie about where he is and what he's doing to get a contract? Is that a thing? I have not, I have not seen that. That's awesome. Though. It just shows you what this kid's Smart. about, right? It just shows you how much he wanted it. it. shows you that, you know, he was willing to do and say whatever to get his chance, and, and he's taking full advantage of it. I'm happy for him. That's that's one of those good lies, kids. That's a good lie. Uh, you're allowed to do those. Yeah. Uh, look, this, I, I, yeah, we, you talked we, about We've all ahead. lied. We've, We've all, all lied. lied and said we we know how to uh, work Excel at a job yeah. interview, and then you yeah, get a I job and got to <laughs> Google how to work Excel. So, I, I I love the story, and you know it's a look. He's had a great season. It's unfortunate that they're down three one in the in the playoffs, but he's definitely made his his place in the league and and made his reputation known now. And it's crazy because I remember both twins played well in in Charlotte. It's not like they weren't superstars, but they took advantage of the minutes they got out there as well. So. Uh, you know, having to rush and find a booster and all that stuff. That's, I, I will say though, him riding the scooter to and from is the most Miami thing I mean, ever. Like, I, so many that's details. Hilarious. I, I love everything about that story. <laughs> um, the, the tw you mentioned, Eddie, that Twitter's got that thing going on right now about how this has been the wackiest NBA season of all time. This weekend gave us like three more stories as if it couldn't get any better. And one of them is this uh, <laughs> I don't know why Connor McGregor. <laughs> is doing a, an ad in the middle of a game, but he did this so realistically that that poor guy had to go to the ER. Is this the dumbest simulation that we're all living in right now? Please help me understand. What what am I looking at right now? <laughs> Chandler, have you ever, Eddie, have you ever seen this in your life? I mean, I gotta say, like, when I when I saw this, I thought it was a little aggressive, right? Like I was yes. like, this looks, this looks super. This the looks second super punch was real. crazy. It's unnecessary. <laughs> the second punch. I you know what Connor was is? on a little bit of that whiskey he's selling. I, I don't it's, know what was going on with that. I don't Bolt, know if you guys Brave watched. of the mascot to agree to this, though. Like, there's no way you? I'm agreeing to that. I'm not agreeing. I'm Maybe he's little, uh, but his punch packs a lot. I'm not doing yeah. it. Yeah, I'm waiting on a pending <laughs> lawsuit from this guy that got punched. I haven't seen any of those stories yet, but also WWE, WWE has officially crossed Connor McGregor off, too, because he does oh, not no. know how to fix <laughs> No, no, because you know what that reminded me of? When Brock Lesnar first went to WWE, He could you could tell he didn't know the line yet. And there were moments where oh, like, oh, that guy's yeah. going to die. <laughs> so, yeah, no, that's that's what it reminds me of. Connor's just small, so he has that going for him. Um, yeah, dumbest season of all time in the best of ways. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, George Carl joins the show. We're going to talk Nuggets, and we're going to talk everything there else. There he is. <laughs> we'll be back. Run it back, run it up, run it back, run it up. Oh, I like I like that song. A Hall of Fame coach joining us today. Playoffs 22 times, five different teams, nine times with the Nuggets. George Carl is here. George, we have so much we want to ask you. We're going to jump right in. Good morning, first of all. But I, I, you're in Denver. The Nuggets on the verge of their first ever championship is this the best version of a nuggets team you've ever seen i have to say yes uh <laughs> you know our, our team that went to the western conference finals 20, 2009 i thought the next year was the best version of our team uh and that was the year i got sick and we stopped there so late and then that year after that Melo made the request to be traded so uh I think it was a situation that we had a really good run. This team has had a, a similar run. I think it's fantastic because I think Jokic has been underlooked, underappreciated, underaccepted, and now everybody's realizing what a great player he is. And, and I think that their roster now is, in a very quiet way, become probably the best roster in the Western Conference. And might have been the West best roster for the last year or two. Dang, love that. George, as a coach, how would you stop a player like Nikola Jokic? 
You know, a lot of guys come into town and they call me up, they take me to breakfast or lunch and they ask me that same question. I don't know. I, my, my, my belief in great <laughs> players is you gotta change the look that you give them constantly throughout the game. And I don't know how many teams now are built defensively to do that. Most teams in the NBA now are built probably more offensive oriented than having a combination of different defenses. The teams that had success a little bit this year played small on them and brought the big guys to the double team instead of playing big and bringing the little guys to the double team. Um, I think you got to be physical with them. And I think the big thing that Miami has found out, if you have a chance to beat them, is you can't let them be a facilitator. Every time he gets 10 assists, they win. I think they won almost 90% of their games this year when, when Jokic just had 10 assists. And he loves to facilitate more than he likes to score. I really think the guy could average 40 points a game if he wanted to. <laughs> Yeah, Coach, you, so talking about Jokic here, you've obviously coached against some of the greats. Uh, have you ever had to game plan for anybody like a Jokic, maybe like a Shaq, or who, who you got on that kind of level? Over the years, uh, I've always thought Shaq was the most difficult guy to game plan against because a lot of times you didn't have a guy that could cover uh, you had to cover him with multi-bodies and foul trouble. And, uh, you know, I know Michael Jordan was very difficult to cover. Uh, Kevin Durant in my time was really difficult, I think, to cover. Kobe Bryant, when he gets into rhythm, was very difficult to cover. Well, I was blessed to have the opportunity to cover a lot of great players. But what I love about Jokic is there's no nonsense to playing the game the right way. He demands almost everybody on his team to play the game the right way. And because of that, I think they've turned into being the best team in the NBA. And I really admire that because in today's game, superstardom sometimes is more individually oriented. The superstar is totally committed to be doing it through the team, making the team better, and winning because we're a team. Coach, from 115 to the number 15, you coach, Carmelo Anthony. A lot of people wondering how the Nuggets will handle that number in the future going forward. Do you think they can? Should they retire the number for both guys? What do you think they should do there? Mm. I, I, don't, I don't deny that Melo deserves to be in the Raptors, as does Jokic. Um, I don't know how they handle that. Denver Nuggets has many different jerseys, maybe one with one jersey, another with the other. Um, I, I, Melo was the best scorer I've ever coached. I've never had an offensive player like that other in my time. And, and it was kind of in the year when the game was changing from defense to offense. And Melo was kind of a leader there, along with, you know, other guys like Kevin Durant, guys like that who could put big numbers on the board. The game has become a very offensive-oriented game. Uh, the three ball was analytically exploded all over the place. And the game has definitely changed. But Melo deserves to be in the rafters here in Denver, in my opinion. It's such a, tr it's such a tricky one. I can't believe this is going to be a, a situation. All right, Coach, I, I, everyone talks about good, but I want both. I want the <clears> best <throat> thing about coaching Melo and the worst thing about coaching Melo. Um... <laughs> the best thing about coaching Melo was offensively, he gave you games where he couldn't lose. Mm. He was so explosive. And he was also a very good clutch player. People don't remember that Melo was probably a good, not, not one of, he was probably one of the top four or five guys in the, in the fourth quarter mm. when he was in his prime. Uh, the most difficult time, I think, coaching Melo is the. Melo had an ability to do a triple-double every night. People don't realize he was a great rebounder and a pretty damn good passer. But he was committed, and, and, and he was kind of dominated by He had to score points. 
to get his recognition. I wish he had been more committed to be more of a triple-double guy. Today's game rewards triple-doubles a little bit more than back 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, and then I think, um, I don't know if this is a bad or a good thing, but Melo believed in himself more than he believed in his team. No, this is the exact opposite. Jokic believes in the team more than he believes in himself. And I think in times of toughness and mental toughness is needed, I think the team wins more than the individual does. Hmm. Yeah, you, you never end up winning a title in Denver, Coach, but do you ever look back and think this year or this team, man, we, we, we should have or we could have? Well, you know, I, I love my coaching career. I, I really enjoyed being on in a kind of a small market, overachieving type of basketball team. We had a lot of them in Seattle. We had some of them here in Denver. We had one in Milwaukee. And it, it was kind of, you know, that it was kind of like the, the Denver Nuggets didn't get a lot of recognition. Everybody wanted to deny that they were very, very, very good. And now that they're on the verge of winning a championship, um, I, I, I would say 70, 80 percent of me is celebratory. And I can't deny every once in a while, I wish I would have had the opportunity to maybe coach a guy like Jokic. You, you managed a lot of personalities in, personalities in your career. You, Carmelo, who we've talked about, you coached Allen Iverson, Gary Payton, the list goes on and Ooh. on and on. Is there ever a guy that you just could not see eye to eye with, no matter how hard you tried? Um, <laughs> I mean, I had my nightmares with players. I mean, I mean, um, my feeling in my coaching career is I always wanted to be a we team and not a me team. And I always wanted to play as a team more than as an individual star. And so, the guys that didn't want to play that way, I had, I had, I had battles with. I had battles with them. Gary Payton and I are right now are one of my best friends. And Gary and I battled more than anybody. But we always came out in a game and competed to win the game the right way. Um, you know, in Milwaukee, we made a trade for Anthony Mason that didn't work out. Uh, that was somewhat troublesome to the team. I know Ray Allen was in my Anthony didn't get along and we went to the conference finals and then the next year we fell apart. That would be the one time that I think it, it destroyed the team more than any, any other place I was at. Wow. Huh. George, that team with Allen Iverson and Carmelo Anthony, that was a fun team, a lot, a lot of scoring. Um, what was your favorite part about coaching Allen Iverson? What was the most amazing thing uh, you saw him do and just overall what was it like coaching him? Well people don't understand how small Alan Iverson is and I was amazed how hard he could play and still do what he did. Uh, I know uh, his ability to score points was harder than for, you know, for I mean, a little guy on the screen, and they named today, and, and when when Alan played, there was more physical contact. And I thought he was just a, a gamer or a winner. He was a competitive guy. Uh, that, that's, I think, in a lot of ways, changed our game, even though we don't give him a lot of credit. But there was, you know, in the 80s and 90s of the NBA, little guys didn't exist. And Allen Iverson brought the little guy back to the game of basketball in many, many ways. And uh, I, I was fortunate to coach him for a couple of years. And, you know, I had him on the downward side a little bit, but he still had many amazing games for us. Brought back the little guy. All right, Coach, you know you know, I have to ask this one question because we had Kenyon Martin on the show last week. Um, and... To put it mildly, he has not forgiven you still for suspending him for the 2006 playoffs. I know you saw the clip. Were you were you surprised at his response? Was there anything there that kind of got you? Oh, 
It's made me sad. I, I, you know, it, it disappoints that I could get a person that angry or that disappointed in me. Uh, I want to love my players. I want to care for my players. But I am also the, the leader and the policeman of my team. And my response in that game, I don't think was out of control or unusual. I, I was doing something I thought I had to do for my team. Uh, I might have been wrong. I don't, I, you know, I, 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 you know, what you know, when those things happen, you want to move forward. You don't want to go backwards. And uh, to suspend them in that situation was very difficult for the organization. I know it was very difficult for him. Um, I think Kenny Martin is, I mean, I'm going to tell you, I thought he was one of the brightest defensive players I've ever coached. And I thought he'd make a hell of a coach because he's a competitive guy. I also said that in the book that I wrote, that everybody doesn't read all the book. I mean, I, I really think, uh, you know, Kenyon is a competitive SOB, tough to handle at times, tough and difficult to handle his first teammates and for the other team. But he played the right way, he played to win. And the, many of the wins here was because he was the nucleus of our defense. We weren't a great defensive team, but because of him, we were a good defensive team. Yeah, we're also now seeing coaches, you know, fired after winning coach of the year or a couple of years after winning a championship. Do you think it's it's gotten out of control, or do you think expectations are too high for coaches? Yes, no, definitely. There's no, there's no <laughs> question. The territory of the coach, the influence of the coach, is going downhill. I don't know if it will ever come back. I don't think management wants it to come back. I don't think agents wants it to come back. They like the interaction of management and agents controlling the, the decision-making. I'm not sure that's the way it should be, but as a coach, I, I mean, I'm, I have a, my son's a coach. I tell him, this is probably the way it's going to be. Until something changes it, I think it's going to continue on this path. Someone told me the other day that 19 of the 30 coaches have been fired in the last two years. I think that's a little ridiculous if you think about it. If you think about it, my, my belief really is there's not a lot of bad coaching in the NBA. There's a lot of coaching that doesn't win, but really, I think a lot of owners now want to find the magician that can pull a championship out of the hat. And be, to win a championship, you got to have process, you got to have a culture, and you got to have a good coach, and you got to have a hell of a lot of good players. Coach, on that same token, do you feel like it's more of a players' league today than it was when you were coaching? And, and because of that, do you feel like your coaching style would have to change in today's game? I, I tried to play basketball for fun. I mean, my, most of the time, I was a very, very, I demanded detail. I, lo I love it. You know, in Seattle, we played defense aggressively. Here in, Den in Denver, we played offense aggressively. I tried to play my system, build upon the strengths and weaknesses of my players, not on my philosophy, but what fit their philosophy. I love coaching. I love the, the evolving of what you have to do to be, become a good basketball team. It's a lot of times it's a putting a puzzle together over an 82 game season can be difficult, but when you do it, it's celebratory, it's fun, it's energizing. And I was blessed to have a lot of really good teams and a lot of good runs in the NBA. I just never got to the mountaintop. Yeah, one of those great runs, George, was in Seattle. Seven years there, seven playoff appearances, went to the NBA Finals. Uh, we know, obviously, Sean Kemp, Gary Payton, they were the superstar duo of, of that team. What was it like coaching them 
and just that run that you guys had, and are they the best duo you've ever coached? Um, yeah, that's by far. Is my team in Seattle? Yeah, our my teams in Seattle were we were very close. We stubbed our toe a couple of years and losing in the first round, uh, but we went to the Western Conference Finals early in the early in the run with Sean and Garrett. And then we lost a couple of years and we came back and went to the NBA Finals. And of course, Michael was in our way. <laughs> um, but in that playoffs, I thought Gary and Sean proved to the world that they were damn good. And people forget that Sean played really well in that NBA Final. In fact, he got MVP votes. I think Michael got five and, and, and Sean got three and on, from a losing team. And um, Sean and Gary drove me a little crazy, but what I loved about them, they were competitors. When the game started, they were focused, they were disciplined, they were demanding. And, um, and we, you know, we came up short. Uh, I just wish we would have had a healthy Nate McMillan in the series we played against the Chicago Bulls because with Nate McMillan, we were really, really, really good. Without him, we were just damn good. Coach, you mentioned Nate McMillan, that maybe that was the thing. Or, hear me out, it was in the last dance, MJ said that you snubbed him during the finals in a restaurant. Now, maybe Nate McMillan would have made a difference. Or, if you would have just gone over and said hello in the restaurant, do you think that would have changed everything? No. He would have found something else to piss him off. Yeah, that's fair. Anyway, I mean, we know the system. You know, Michael needed something to piss him off. <laughs> and uh, I really don't remember the situation. I know I was in a couple restaurants with him. Um, I've known Michael since then. I play golf with him three or four <laughs> times. He's never brought up the subject to me. Uh, but, I mean, it was a great run. And uh, Michael would have found a way. And I'll be honest with you, I thought. I thought we did a good job with Mike in that playoff series. I think he shot under 40%. He only had one game where he was the reason they kicked our butts. Uh, Dennis Rodman and Kukos and, and, and Pippen, a lot of that. It was a defensive-minded playoff series. I think the last game was actually 86-78, the, the sixth game. Um, we were a very good defensive team, and they were a little bit better than we were. Coach, this has been an absolute pleasure. I know it's early in Denver. I know the city is alive and well. Enjoy the night. Enjoy the festivities when and if uh, they should occur. We appreciate it. <laughs> I am so I'm so happy for the fans of Denver, the fans of the ABA yes. back with Doug Moe and Larry Brown. Uh, the only other final they went to was in seventy. 75 or 76 when they played Julius Irving yep. in the ABA. In the last ABA championship. And now Denver, after what, 47, 48 years? Yeah. I think they're going to get it. I hope it's tonight. But they better be careful. There are a lot of teams, 3-1, that have lost this game. But they've never lost the series. That's what's on their side right now. That's I think Denver that will, will win it. And I hope it's tonight. Thank you, sir. We appreciate it. Sh uh, Shams, we're also going to say goodbye to you. What a, what a great company to be leaving in. Shams leaving with Coach George Carl. Love everything about that. The three of us, though, not going anywhere because Wemby struggled in a game yesterday. Ask me if I give a bleep. We'll talk about that when we come back. Run it back. Run it up. Run it back. Run it up. Run it back. Run it Oh, yeah. Time for a little you buying that. You know, all eyes on Wemby, uh, Victor Wembanyama. They're playing the French League final out on France. Uh, game one, though, eight points, seven rebounds, two assists in 27 minutes. Oh, what is that, Chandler? Are you, are you buying that he should be playing this close to the draft, by the way? Yeah, I, I, I'm not buying that. If I'm pop, I am just holding my breath every possession this kid plays until he's a spur. Um, the struggles, no, that's going to happen. And I also respect the, the, the way that he's finishing this season and he's finishing what he started. Uh, he's going to have ups and downs. I think, you know, 
the expectations also they're going to have to manage him coming in with such a buzz and such a you know, argument that he's the greatest prospect of all time when you look at his frame when you look at what he presents it's it's going to be a it's going to be a process and he's going to end up being a hell of a player but he's going to have a lot of 8.7 rebound games but I think the issue here is, yeah, him even playing. If I'm the Spurs, uh, I don't necessarily love that he's playing these games, but I respect <laughs> it is a hooper and he wants to be competing. And I, I love that he's finishing what he started with this team in France. But, yeah, hold your breath till that till that draft and you can get Ooh. your hands on him. I don't love it if I'm the Spurs either, but that team paid a premium to have that young man play basketball for them, and now he's in the finals in that league. So, yeah, you got to do what you got to do. I'd actually be kind of bummed if he sat out the finals and basically said, yo, I'm off to the NBA. Like, we've seen some college players do as of late. And and, and I remember uh, Lonzo Ball got a lot of flack when he was in the locker room. He was not upset that the UCLA Bruins had lost, and he was like, yeah, I'm going to the league, guys. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit of both, but it, it would be a little hypocritical because, yo, they're going to play him in a month in the summer league. So, you know, get, get all the work you can in, young fella. You, we're we're going to need you ready for next season. Yeah, he's young. It'll be fine. It's fine. I'm just telling myself that. It's going to be fine. Uh, Raptors <laughs> got themselves a new coach, hiring Grizzlies assistant Darko Ryakovic to be their next guy. Eddie, you buying that? I'm very interested to see what this means for the future of that team. I know there's rumors coming out this week that they're not blowing it up after rumors all year that they would, and they have tradable contracts. They have a mix of veterans and young guys. Uh, Darko's lauded as a player development guy in the league. A lot of people credit uh, Devin Booker's development to, towards him. So I'm very interested to see what, what, what he, his stamp will be on this team, but it seems like the Raptors are preparing for both. They're preparing for... Continuing on with the team that they have as of now, and they're complain- they're com- preparing for some player development, and uh, that's a good place to be. A uh, lot to be decided out there in Toronto still, and and this is just the beginning of that. Yeah, I like this a lot. You know how I feel about just the cesspool of the coaches getting fired and hired and thrown around. Uh, I like this guy. I like to hire like when when the Grizzlies hired Taylor Jenkins. A lot of people are like, who is this guy? What's he gonna do? This mm-hmm. is that similar situation where it's a fresh start it's a young dude he's excited uh he's had a track rush a track record of having a you know success so i love this i'm all for a new young guy getting an opportunity rather than on one of these other coaches that just they just keep funneling through and, and give them more chances so i don't know much about him um i i do know whether they're tanking whether they're keeping it together i i love the idea of having this guy and a new coach and a fresh face you know, kind of being the leader of that. It means Doc Rivers doesn't have a job, guys. So now we're on lookout. Or does he go back into the booth? Who who knows? We're taking a quick break. We'll come back and we'll have an entire segment on Zion Williamson because I can't get enough when Run It Back returns. (laughs) Run It It Back, yeah, yeah. Get in on the NBA Finals action right from the first tip with FanDuel. Right now, you can make the finals even more exciting with bets that can get you an early W. Bet on race to 15, first basket score, method of first basket score, and so much more. There's no better place to bet all the finals action than America's number one sportsbook. Download the app, get a quick W today. FanDuel, official sportsbook betting partner of the NBA. All right, you guys, got a a couple seconds left here at the end. Predictions for tonight. Does the trophy get hoisted? Chandler. Yes, although part of me <laughs> thinks that they'd rather win in Miami and celebrate at Live or 11. Ooh, I think it gets done tonight, but I do think the Heat cover the spread. Yeah, eight and a half's a lot, Eddie. It's a lot. I got the Nuggets uh, protecting home court, winning big. I'm happy for a lot of guys on that team. Jokic getting crowned. I'm happy for Jeff Green, all everything he's been yeah, through. Yeah, It's Smith. Christian Braun, the way he worked, the Bruce Brown, like a lot of good stories on that team. I'm happy for those guys. I hope they handle it today, and I think they will. Has there ever been a team with more names mispronounced than the Denver Nuggets? Let's think about that overnight. We'll come back tomorrow. We'll do 20 minutes on that alone. Because if you, I mean, even just Christian Braun, <laughs> that one's everyone gets wrong. But uh, we have Jamal Crawford on the show tomorrow. I am very stoked for that. Uh, he's become a television superstar, like we all knew he would. He'll have his two cents. And maybe we'll be talking about the newest NBA champions out in the Mile High City. Until then, everyone enjoy the games tonight. We will see you bright and early tomorrow morning. Run it up, run it back, run it up.